CEO of the Miramar National Cemetery Support Foundation. On behalf of the Miramar Director, Ms. Greta Hamilton, her staff, Foundation Chairman, Mr. Denny Scoville, and our entire Board of Directors, we welcome you to Miramar National Cemetery. I'd like to make a special welcome to Council General of France, Ms. Julie Duhat-Bado, who drove down from Los Angeles when she heard we would be remembering the D-Day anniversary today. You'll hear from her shortly. I'd also like to welcome Congresswoman Sarah Jacobs and Dr. Gregory Gaddis, who is our, our keynote speaker today. Thank you for being here. We also have a special group with us today, the French American Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for bringing your board of directors and supporters and for partnering with us in this special day. On this Memorial Day weekend, we're reminded of the sacrifices of over 1 million Americans who since the beginning of the Civil War to the present day have died for our freedom. This is our 13th annual Memorial Day ceremony on these hollow grounds. And in just a few days, it will also be the 80th anniversary of D-Day. We could not be more honored to have several World War II veterans with us today. If you're able, can you please stand and be recognized? all for being here today and thank you so much for your service. One of those veterans is U.S. Navy veteran Bob Wilson. Bob Wilson is 104 years young. And Mr. Wilson was on an LST when they landed at Omaha Beach on June 6, 1944. True hero. To all of our World War II veterans, and especially the D-Day veterans for this upcoming anniversary, we salute you and thank you for the service of our country. I would now like to invite Monsignor Mark Campbell from Mary Star of the Sea Catholic Church to deliver uh, today's invitation. our heads in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for bringing us together at this Memorial Day celebration. We come to acknowledge the debt we owe to the men and women of the United States military who have guarded this country with their lives. Today we bow our heads and our hearts to you, Lord, that we will remember those who paid the ultimate price by giving their lives for their country. We can never be grateful enough for the sacrifices they made and we are humbled by their willingness to put their own lives aside for the benefit of ours. Lord God, carve their sacrifices into our hearts so we may never forget the loss of these heroes. They fought on land, at sea, and in the air, always understanding that they may not come back from the mission and accepting that as part of the job. They were willing to risk death to protect this land, which we hold so dear, and the American people along with it. We thank them for their sacrifice and promise we'd carry on their legacy to ensure that they did not die in vain. We also pray today that you strengthen and protect all our military personnel who are serving presently and in the future. Give them the courage to face whatever comes, protect them in battle, and help them prosper in times of peace. Watch over their families. And as you, as you watch over all of us, we put our trust and faith in you, and even though we don't always understand your ways, we accept that you have a plan for each one of us. So we ask you to bless everyone gathered here today, and grant us the strength to rise to the challenges of our time, and meet them in full faith that you will always be with us. Please help us fulfill our personal missions, whatever they may be. Amen.
Let's see your cable. That was beautiful. Um, at this time, ladies and gentlemen, if you're able, please rise for the posting of colors by the Young Marines. Post the colors. Post the colors. Please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance by World War II U.S. veteran, Mr. Andre Chavez. Mr. Chavez, please join me on the stage. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation. Yeah, one nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chavez, and thank you for your service to our country. Now please remain standing while the national anthem is played by Sergeant Andrew Vaughn of the 3rd Marine Aircraft Wing Quintet Band. If you're active duty or a veteran, please render the proper salute. Otherwise, place your hand over your heart. A big, a big round of applause for the
retire the colors. Please be seated. It's now my honor to introduce Ms. Greta Hamilton, the director of Fort Rosecrans and Miramar National Cemeteries. Ms. Hamilton has worked for the Veterans Administration for over 11 years, holding posts as assistant director and director at the National Cemeteries in Lake Worth, Riverside, Marion, and Omaha, as well as leadership positions at the National Cemetery Administration in Washington, D.C. Prior to joining the Veterans Administration, she served in the Air Force, retiring as a major after a 20-year career. Ms. Hamilton holds a Bachelor of Science from East Carolina University, a Master's Degree from Oklahoma University, and a Master's Degree from Washington University. Please let me welcome Director Greta Hamilton. introduction. Good afternoon everyone and welcome to our Memorial Day service ceremony here at Miramar National Cemetery. I'm truly honored that you are here with us today on this Memorial Day to honor those heroes who made the ultimate sacrifice defending our country. Thank you for being a part of our Memorial Day observance. Your support for those who died in the service of our country shows that you understand and you appreciate why our nation sets aside this day to remember, honor, and salute our fallen service members. I feel fortunate to join you in honoring our brave service members and supporting our Gold Star families. The cost of war is incalculable. We can never repay the families who have lost loved ones in the defense of this nation. From the revolution, from the world wars, Korea, Vietnam, the global war on terror, and many other conflicts. Millions of brave Americans willingly stepped into harm's way, knowing that they may not see their family members again. We have an obligation to remember and honor every one of them. And in deference to our scholars here today and Dr. Dadis, there's a quote that I often use, and I can't, and it's attributed to Lincoln but I can't find in what context and when he said it, but it's very Lincoln-esque. And Lincoln said regarding why it is important to honor our military members. He said that a nation that does not honor its heroes will not long endure. And thank you for doing that for over 200 and something years. In our nation's history, brave men and women have worn the uniform of our country, risking their lives on so many days, over many years, and in many different places. Among those places was the treacherous coast of France in 1944. In World War II, American service members like those in other countries sacrificed and persevered. On June 6th, we will mark the 80th anniversary of Operation Overlord, otherwise known as D-Day where more than 156,000 Allied troops executed the largest invasion in modern history. They sailed in nearly 7,000 boats, the biggest armada ever assembled, including more than 4,000 landing vessels. These courageous men assaulted five enemy-held, heavily fortified beaches in France. D-Day is among the most noteworthy days of sacrifice overcoming impossible odds, displaying steadfast devotions to a noble cause. Of these 4,414 Allied deaths, 2,501 were American soldiers. 
To commemorate this important anniversary, we are honored to have in attendance with us today four World War II veterans, um, including among them Bob Wilson, a D-Day veteran. And also we have with us Julie Duel de Debos, the Consulate General of France. Mrs. Duel Debos became the French Consulate in Los Angeles in September 2020 and is a career diplomat in the French Ministry of Europe and Foreign Affairs. She joined the French Ministry of Europe. I'm sorry, she joined the French Ministry of Europe and Foreign Affairs. And prior to that, as posted in LA, she was a deputy head of missions at the French Embassy in Australia and has served in various positions, including the desk officer at Northern Africa and Middle East Division, the political and press counselor at the French Embassy in Tunis, the press counselor at the French Embassy in Ottawa, Canada. Mrs. Duel de Bose is a graduate of the Seance Post Paris and holds a degree in English. In 2019, she was awarded the distinction of the Knight of French National Order of Merit. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mrs. Duel de Bose to the podium to deliver a special remarks on behalf of the people of France. Good afternoon, everyone. Bonjour. Bonjour à tous. Mr. Charles Bailey, President and CEO of Miramar National Cemetery Support Foundation. Mrs. Greta Hamilton, Director of the Fort Wayne France and Miramar National Cemeteries. Dr. Gregory Dadis. Mrs. Marion Lanier, Honorary Consul of France in San Diego. Mrs. Julie Repol, Director of the Alliance Française de San Diego. Mrs. Sylvia Almeri, Director of the French American Chamber of Commerce of San Diego, honorable veterans, distinguished guests. It is a real pleasure to be here in San Diego today with you all for this Memorial Day ceremony. I would like to thank Charles Bailey, President and CEO of the Miramar National Cemetery, and also Holly Schaffner from the Miramar National Cemetery Support Foundation for inviting me and for organizing such a wonderful event. Among the brave veterans present today, I especially want to acknowledge four World War II veterans. Mr. Max Gurney, Mr. Calvin Shiner, Mr. Andre Chapaz, and D-Day veteran Mr. Bob Wilson. I would like to express my gratitude to these heroes. We will never forget your unwavering courage, which helped forge the deep and solid alliance between the United States and France that endures to this day. It is always an immense privilege and an honor to be invited as the Consul General of France to commemorate Memorial Day. But this Memorial Day ceremony is special to me for one particular reason. In just a few days, on June 6, we will commemorate in Normandy the 80th anniversary of D-Day. All American World War II veterans who have fought in France have been invited, all expenses paid. Around 100 of them are expected to make the trip to Normandy with numerous initiatives by nonprofit organizations and companies such as Delta Airlines, United Airlines and Best Defense Foundation. World War II veteran Max Gurney and World War II veteran Calvin Shiner, whom I have just mentioned, will both travel to attend the 80th anniversary. We are so proud and pleased that you will be in Normandy to celebrate the strong ties between our two nations. An international ceremony will take place on Omaha Beach on June 6, presided over by the French President Emmanuel Macron, and attended by President Biden and several heads of state and government, and will be followed by numerous ceremonies in the surrounding area. The 80th anniversary ceremonies are not limited to Normandy. They will also include the Provence landings on August 15 and the liberation of Paris on August 25th. Through this coming commemoration in Normandy, and many events like this one today, 
we French people want to honor and express our gratitude to each and every soldier, man and woman, who contributed to the liberation of France. We also express this gratitude by awarding the French Legion of Honor to World War II foreign veterans. As you may know, the French government has decided to confer the Légion d'honneur to all World War II veterans around the world who have fought in France to pay tribute to those remarkable men and women. The Légion d'honneur was created by Napoleon Bonaparte more than 200 years ago, and it is the highest and most prestigious French award a person can receive. In a few weeks, I will have the privilege of presenting the French Legion of Honor to an American World War II veteran who has fought in France, Mr. David Damaso. And Mr. Bob Wilson will also soon get the Legion of Honor as well, thanks to the help of our uh, liaison officer, uh, veteran Robert Johnson, who is with me today. These Legion of Honor ceremonies, my presence today, and the coming national commemoration of the 80th anniversary of D-Day Normandy, led by President Macron, all testify to the fact that the French government and the French people will never forget these young American soldiers who demonstrated their selflessness, generosity, and courage whilst under fire by the enemy. France has not forgotten the soldiers who have risked and too often lost their lives during those terrible battles. We will forever remember them, those who have made the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom. And we remain grateful because we owe those men our freedom. For more than 240 years, from the plains of Yorktown to the beaches of Normandy, our two countries, the oldest allies in the world, have fought shoulder to shoulder to win or reconquer our freedom and to defend our shared values. We, the French people, know what we owe to this brotherhood of arms that links the United States and France forever. And for this, I would like to express my, our, gratitude with a single word in French. Merci. Thank you. Thank you, Consul General. Beto uh, Beto's for those uh, those involved. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. And once again, the Third Marine Aircraft Wing Band will play our service songs. So if you're active duty or a, or a veteran, please stand and sing along when you hear your branches song. Take it away, Sergeant Vaughn. <laughs> Thank you. 
give a big round of applause. Outstanding. Outstanding. Thank you, Sergeant Vaughn and staff. It's now my honor to introduce today's keynote speaker, U.S. Army retired Dr. Gregory A. Dattis, director of the SDSU Center of War and Society. Dr. Dattis is originally from New Jersey and holds a bachelor's of science degree from the United States Military Academy at West Point, a master's degree from Villanova University, and a PhD from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. After graduating from West Point, Dattis served for 26 years in the United States Army, retiring as a colonel. He's a veteran of both Operations Desert Storm and Iraqi Freedom, and his military awards include the Bronze Star, the Legion of Merit, and the Meritorious Service Medals. His final assignment in the Army was the Chief of the American History Division in the Department of History at the United States Military Academy. Colonel Dattis specializes in Cold War history with an emphasis on the American War in Vietnam. He's authored five books and has participated in a number of initiatives to help educate the larger population on public historical matters. As a part of his military deployments, he served as a command historian to the U.S. Multinational Corps in Iraq. Dattis has published several op-ed pieces commenting on current Mil, uh, excuse me, military affairs to include writings in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, and the National Interest Magazine. Before joining the History Department at SDSU, he directed the Master's Program in the War and Society Studies at Chapman University. He's the recipient of the 2022-2023 Fulbright Distinguished Scholar Award, Pembroke College, University of Oxford. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dattis. Good afternoon, how's everybody doing? Thank you so much for coming today. It is an absolute privilege and an honor to be here. First off, I want to thank Charlie Einott for inviting me to this wonderful ceremony. I also want to note that Charlie, upon first seeing us when we arrived, turned to my wife and said, the Colonel needs a haircut, doesn't he? <laughs> so if any of you have a pair of scissors, please come up now so I can become uh, within the standard. I also want to thank everyone here at the Miramar National Cemetery Support Foundation for what you do. As a historian, I may not be very good at telling you about the future, but I can say with certainty how important the past is to all of us. And it is memorials like this one here and ceremonies like this one today that allow us to reflect upon the past and hopefully draw perspective from it, from it to better navigate for the future. So while I was still teaching at West Point a few years back, I had the privilege to read a, lead a cadet's um, trip to Normandy. We called it a staff ride. And we were there to learn about one of the most important campaigns in the entire Second World War toward French villages and where brave resistance fighters opposed a brutal occupation and defied the Nazi regime through unconventional means. We visited the beachheads upon which Allied forces landed on June 6, 1944. And we made our way through thick hedgerows learning about the breakout that will lead to the liberation of Paris and to the Franco-German border beyond. But what I remember most from that trip aside perhaps from the amazing food, Madam Council General, we have some amazing food, was the day we visited Omaha Beach. The tide just so happened to be out that day. And so we walked to the surf's edge. And then we turned around. And looking back to the heights of saint laurent sur mer I couldn't help but feel a sense of awe. German gun emplacements and strong points still pocketed the rocky bluffs overlooking the beach. If you look carefully, you can still see the deep impressions in the earth along those heights where Allied bombers had dropped their loads to prepare for the largest amphibious operation in the history of mankind. I remember talking with cadets as we looked at those cliffs, 
asking what it would take from them to lead such an assault. The wars in Iraq and Afghanistan both were raging at that point. And these young men and women knew that they too likely would be leading Americans as soldiers in combat. What did they think it felt like on June 6th, so many years ago? The sights, the sounds, the utter chaos and confusion. Could they similarly endure and lead and prevail? We spent that morning reflecting on what leadership really means, what sacrifice really entails. And as we prepared to move to the next beachhead that morning, this one, Utah, where the U.S. 4th Infantry Division had landed, the cadets thatched out a huge beat Navy sign in the sand to take a group picture, because that's what cadets do. But as they did, I couldn't help but shake the feeling that what happened on this very sand so long ago required near superhuman strength. I'd seen combat in Iraq, but this seemed near impossible. Perhaps no wonder then that General Dwight D. Eisenhower, commanding Operation Overlord, had actually drafted a resignation letter the night before, just in case the landing force had been pushed back into the sea. Ike worried that the failure at that beach that morning might jeopardize the very essence of democratic freedoms. Looking back, he wasn't alone. You know, we talk a lot today about freedoms about how they are under assault, not just from outside our nation, but from within. And I think there are some merits to those concerns. But we would be remiss in thinking that those who preceded us weren't equally concerned, even our founding fathers. Recall Benjamin Franklin, who upon exiting the convention or the Constitutional Convention was asked by a group of citizens what sort of government the delegates had created. His answer, a republic, if you can keep it. The brevity of that response made the meaning more powerful. Democratic institutions require the active and informed involvement of people for their continued good health. And 80 years ago, our national leaders knew the value of fighting for freedom and of fighting against the fears that threatened that freedom. On January 6, 1941, with Europe already at war, and some three years to go before the D-Day landings, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt delivered his State of the Union Address, soon to be known as the Four Freedoms Address. The language was as aspirational as any president had ever orated. FDR advocated for sweeping objectives on universal human rights of committing the United States to full support of all those resolute people everywhere who are resisting aggression. Of course, we saw in the villages and cities across France in 1941, that resistance already was growing day by brutal day. And then the president delivered his denouement. He spoke of a new post-war world order founded upon four essential human freedoms of speech and expression, of the right to worship God in his or her own way, of freedom from want, and perhaps most importantly in an age of totalitarian aggression, of freedom from fear. Roosevelt emphasized this last point, loftily calling for a worldwide reduction in armaments so that no nation will be in a position to commit an act of physical aggression against any neighbor anywhere in the world. Roosevelt argued that this was no vision of a distant millennium, but after December 7th, 1941, the United States quickly found itself committed to acts of physical aggression quite literally around the world. For Americans, before general knowledge of the Nazi regime's genocidal policies became public, the war in the Pacific seemed especially frightening. Countless propaganda posters depicted the foes there as clawed beasts, dark and shadowy, knife-wielding inhumans lunging at unsuspecting American civilians. 
This is your enemy, one propaganda poster declared. For nearly four years, the United States and its allies waged a fierce war in the Pacific. Remote islands hosting some of the most brutal fighting in human history. The young Americans also found themselves at all points across the globe. They struggled to survive in the scorching and dusty deserts of North Africa. They trudged across the rocky mountains of Italy. They sailed across the Atlantic and flew over Europe. They saw the very worst of what modern war could deliver, and yet they kept moving forward. The vicious fighting came to a climactic, some would argue horrific, end in August 1945 and the final surrender, sem surrender sem sem ceremony on the decks of the USS Missouri followed in early September. But rather just memorializing the end of the Second World War here today, of only venerating those celebrated Americans of the greatest generation who are here today, perhaps we should pause and ask how that conflict truly helped fulfill Roosevelt's dream of a world in which aggression was no longer possible. After four years of war, was the United States, and the larger world for that matter, truly free from fear? The historical records suggest not so much. Only two years after the surrender ceremony on the Missouri, the United States found itself at the beginning of a decades-long Cold War between, between superpowers that have global repercussions. Communism easily replaced fascism and Nazism as the greatest threat to national, if not global, security. Stalin, according to some, seemed only a new Hitler with a better mustache. Mustaches aside, the fear was real, even for the greatest generation fresh from winning a war in the name of democracy and freedom. By early 1950, Wisconsin Senator Joseph McCarthy was gaining national attention by arguing the United States was engaged in a final, all-out battle against its atheistic, communistic foe. Science fiction novel, novelist Ray Bradbury might reason, with some merit, that when, when, the, when the wind is right, a faint odor of kerosene is exhaled from Senator McCarthy. But clearly, McCarthy was striking a chord with many Americans. Communism from abroad and apparently within America's own borders, was a threat that could not be ignored. The global war to achieve freedom from fear that ended in 1945 needed to continue. This long preamble in a way is to offer a rather uncomfortable proposition, if I may. Ever since 1941, the United States has been in an almost constant state of war. From the Cold War that held the entire globe in its grip year after year, to more hot conflicts in Korea and Vietnam, from an unbroken military presence in the Middle East to Asia and Africa after 9-11, Americans have been in a state of perpetual war for more than eight decades. The number of soldiers needed to fight these wars has certainly varied over time, as has our collective interest level. But it seems undeniable that our modern definitions of freedom are inherently linked with words like security and defense and military readiness and yes, war. This truth should give us all pause in asking us to, or, or asking some pretty fundamental questions for us, especially on a weekend when we memorialize those who sacrificed all in times of war. Is it possible that being in a constant state of war inhibits rather than promotes our own freedoms and the freedoms of others? Could it be that war is a deterrent rather than a promoter of liberty and freedom? The answers to such questions might tell us a bit about our own society today and the relationship between the United States and the rest of the world. In fact, I would suggest these questions cut to the very heart of our national identity. It seems plausible 
that being in a near persistent state of conflict for the past eight decades, since 1941, has shaped what it means to be an American. So today, as we remember the courage of those who landed on D-Day and memorialize those who sacrificed all in the fight to be free from fear, I'd like to challenge you. Challenge you all not just to honor their surface and their sacrifices, but to emulate them. It takes courage to fight against fear. And not just abroad, but at home. It takes courage to turn away from the partisan attacks that divide us, instead seek ways to unify us as Americans. It takes courage, dare I say, to think about the resources we spend on maintaining, if not enlarging, the military industrial complex and how those resources might be reprioritized for the good of all humanity. I've been served in the U.S. Army for more than 25 years and not so naive to believe that military force is a crucial component of our foreign policy. Or perhaps we should start questioning some of our basic assumptions when we think about war. That our ideals matter more than our weapons. That our national strength should come more from our example than from our armaments. That our freedoms are more than just an adjunct to national security. That all of us can and should take part not just in producing freedom, but promoting true freedom. And what I've laid out here, what President Roosevelt aspired to in 1941, should not be mere rhetoric on a windy Sunday afternoon. Essential human freedoms of speech, of worship, from want and from fear, these should matter not just to all Americans, but to all of us on this planet. I still remember standing on Omaha Beach with that group of West Point cadets in sheer awe of the courage it took those Americans and their allies to prevail in 1944. Looking over this cemetery today, I don't want to just honor them. I want to do my best to emulate them and their courage. And how wonderful would it be to actually realize President Roosevelt's ultimate goal and contribute to a world in which our freedoms, all of our freedoms, are truly realized. And we have examples right here in front of us to get there. We just have to follow the lead. Thank you. That was outstanding. Thank you, Dr. Dennis. Before we close our ceremony, I want to take a minute to introduce our foundation board of directors, seated right here in front of me. Um, seated uh, in front of me and truly run the programs and business of our foundation, including helping make upgrades to the Memorial Amphitheater, which is where you're sitting right now. This is the last year for the chairs. The chairs are gone. Uh, Soleil and Denny and everybody have been working their tails off for years, and we're going to have bench, permanent bench seating out here, uh, hopefully before uh, next year's ceremony. So last year for the seats. So Soleil, Denny, the board. Also, our, our avenue of flags you saw as you came up, uh, we change those out twice a year before Memorial Day and before Veterans Day, and uh, gotta keep the place looking beautiful. We have our Veterans Tribute Tower over this way in Carillion, and our Memorial Walkway. So I'd encourage you to, to take a look, walk around, check out some of the features uh, that we have here at the cemetery. And I also wanna thank our Public Information Officer, Holly Shafter, She's behind the camera over here today. Give a round of applause for Holly. Thank you, Holly. Appreciate all you do. I'd like to personally thank everyone who was part of our ceremony and made it a memorable day. Council General Duhat Bados, Dr. Dadis, Monsignor Campbell, Ms. Hamilton, the Third Marine uh, Wing Aircraft Band, and Mr. Chavez. In a few minutes, you'll hear bagpiper John Forrest play Amazing Grace. 
the then bugler David Coberance will play taps. Thank you to everybody. And lastly, the, those behind the scenes who made this ceremony possible, once again, Director Hamilton and her staff, the young Marines, the, the Boy Scouts, and the Sea Cadets. Thank you very much, everybody, for all of your support and helping us get this together. Appreciate it. And now I'd like to invite Monsignor Campbell back to deliver the benediction. Certainly I would like to express my deep gratitude to the persons who organized this delightful Memorial Day ceremony today. Women and men who worked cooperatively together with serious purpose and intention, painstakingly noting every detail that could be realized and that has been realized. And the wonderful words that we have heard from our speakers so edifying, so inspiring, so challenging in these times, particularly well worth pause to reflect on. And so, Heavenly Father, we are deeply grateful to all who made this day possible for us here at Miramar National Cemetery. We thank you for bringing us together to pay tribute to those who lost their lives defending our nation. May their souls live on in your precious presence and may they experience the full measure of your love and mercy always. We ask that you guide each of us and make us worthy of the sacrifices from which we have benefited. We pray that we may never forget how blessed we truly are as a nation, as a people, and as your sons and daughters. With grateful hearts, let us go forth in peace this day. Amen. And now, Mr. John Forrest will play Amazing Grace. Mr. Forrest. Thank you, Mr. Forrest. No matter how many times I hear Amazing Grace, it still gets me. Thank you so much. Once again, if you're able to rise, we're going to have the playing of Taps by Mr. David Koberitz from the Bugles Across of America. If you're former military or active duty, please render the proper salute. Otherwise, place your right, your right hand over your heart.
please be seated. Thank you, Mr. Coburn. That was beautiful. I want to thank everyone for attending our ceremony. Um, if you've not visited the 10 memorials on the Memorial Walk Walkway or the Veterans Tribute Tower in Carillion, you can do it today or during regular cemetery hours open every day of the week, sunrise and sunset. Also, please visit our newly updated website and follow us on social media. We look forward to seeing you in 2025 and hope you have a great rest of your day and may God bless the United States of America.